Hello everyone and welcome to this very last video. This is going to be a course outro video for the Dell Chemistry Outreach course. And what we're going to be doing in this video is a nice casual office hour style review. And I'm going to do two things really. I'm going to overview the relationship between the fundamentals of this course and the more detailed topics that you're going to see in the fall semester. And then I'm going to go through the 10 question types for the outro quiz, which is a no pressure survey quiz, but I still want you to take it seriously and do your best on it. But before we jump into all that, I do want to say congratulations, because if you're watching this video, that means you've probably gone through all five units of the course and you're ready to finish up. And that is no easy feat. So I'm very proud of everyone who has gotten to this point. And once again, congratulations. But now let's jump into comparing the fundamentals of this course to the fall semester, because you can definitely see that the units match up here. But what you're going to notice is that for something like gas laws, you see that we have ideal and non-ideal gases. So all of this is going to be new information in the fall semester. But it's my belief that if you have a firm understanding of the ideal gas laws, you are going to be primed to really grasp that material very quickly. So typically, a fall semester is going to look like what we see here on the right, where you go fundamentals, gas law, atomic theory, bonding. Depending on your professor, you might see gas laws actually sneak somewhere behind bonding and intermolecular forces. That just depends on the professor, but this is the typical sequence right here. Other things that might be worth noting, atomic theory is a pretty tough unit. We get into light a little bit more details with quantum mechanics, especially dealing with the experiments. Um, and then we jump into periodic table trends, which feeds into bonding. And one thing that we didn't talk about in this unit in our course is intermolecular forces. So you see that I have it listed here, but we never really talked about it. And those are the forces that exist between molecules. Because what we focused on in this course is talking about the covalent and ionic bonds that exist within a molecule or a compound. So that is something that you have to look forward to. In addition to some more details with what we call bonding theories, which is just sort of how chemists further describe what a bond is, either using quantum mechanics or things called hybrid orbitals. So that is another detail that you have to look forward to. Lastly, we have thermodynamics, which is measuring heat and energy transfer, which we definitely talked about in the thermodynamics module. But then we're going to talk about other state functions. So we actually have what we call enthalpy, which we give an H. We have internal energy, which we did talk about. We have Gibbs free energy and entropy. And so that's three state functions that we didn't talk about in this course that you're going to talk about in the fall semester. So don't get overconfident with thermodynamics because it is a very difficult course, but it's so many months away that I didn't want to bog you down with that information. Now, when we move on to talking about the quiz, the first thing that I want to mention is that this unit of thermodynamics, because it is so far away, I'm going to say not on the quiz. All right, so that should be very good news. Um, I just don't think that it's absolutely essential. So if you didn't fully understand heat work and the first law of thermodynamics, don't worry because it's going to be until probably November that you see it again. But by then you will have kind of figured out how to study for chemistry. So you will be prepared for it when the time comes along. So in preparation for this intro quiz, I have a list of 10 things that I want you to know. And these I can, am kind of considering to be question types. So we're going to start with fundamentals. This is all going to be in order. And I'm just going to talk through each point. But in preparation for this quiz, what I really recommend you do is 
redo the lesson quizzes from unit one through unit four. But let's start with this, um, going through each of these, and there's gonna be 10 here. But these first three are gonna come from unit one. And it's gonna start with understanding the mole and why it's important to chemistry. And you really want to be able to define a mole in your own words. And one of the buzzwords I used for this was a packet of atoms or molecules. And then we kind of broke that word packet up and we said that that is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that does give a nice little definition. It's an Avogadro's number of atoms or molecules. And so let's even add that, that this is Avogadro's number, which you see as an N a like that but why is it important to chemistry it's important to chemistry because when you see something like carbon on the periodic table and you see that that is 12.01 and we can put that atomic number six what does that 12.01 mean well literally what it should mean is 12.01 atomic mass units but that's not really a measurement that we use in the lab so instead what we say is that is also 12.01 grams per mole and the way to convert between these two is to say that this atomic mass unit this 12 atomic mass units is going to be one carbon atom and then this 12.01 grams per mole, that is gonna be one mole. So it's important to understand sort of the why there, that a mole is a packet of atoms, but that number is important because it's the conversion between the atomic mass unit and the mole or the gram per mole. Now, number two is composition stoichiometry. Um, and there's really three things I want you to see here um, the first thing you have your basic conversions so you want to know that you can go from moles to mass you can even go from molecules to moles and so you can do all of these conversions remember molecules to moles that's going to use Avogadro's number and then moles to mass that's going to use the molar mass and you have a help sheet that'll take you through each one of those specific conversions. But don't forget within all this, that role of molar mass. So molar mass is going to be grams per mole. And this is actually really important for identifying a species on the periodic table. So it helps you if you know what the molar mass is for a for an element, for example, you know actually what that element is because you can refer to the periodic table. So if you do a conversion and you see that you have um, a molar mass of 12.01 grams per mole, you can determine if it is just the element that it is carbon, something like that. Um, number three is gonna be reaction stoichiometry. This is definitely the hardest part of unit one. Reaction stoichiometry, I just want to make sure you're able to work with simple ratio problems, predict the output and the excess of limiting reagent, um, the output and excess of limiting reagent problems. So you want to be able to not only have a way of figuring out what the limiting reagent is, but also figuring out how much excess is left over, um, all things that are really important to unit one. So let's jump to unit two. That's going to be four and five right here. And this is going to be um, just an idea of conceptualizing the modern atomic model. And what does that mean? Well, the key point that I want you to understand is that you have a nucleus and those are going to have protons and neutrons. 
And remember, neutrons are neutrally charged, protons are positively charged, so that overall, this nucleus is definitely going to be positively charged. But then you have electrons, and this is where the modern atomic model or quantum mechanics comes into play. It is not these particles rotating around in circular or elliptical orbits. Instead, what, the, what quantum mechanics is going to suggest is that it is more of a cloud. So if you draw something like an s orbital, it's more like that. If you draw something like a p orbital, it might be more like that. So you do want to have an idea of that, basically that the atomic model is a positively charged nucleus that consists of protons and neutrons, and then the negatively charged electrons exist in these cloud-like orbitals. And now I've got this funky, not very accurate looking cloud structure with p orbitals and s orbitals. I've got a better drawing of this in my help sheets. Now number five is describe the four quantum numbers based on what they represent. Be able to identify possible and invalid quantum number sets. So let's talk very quickly about this. We have n, we have l, we have m sub l, and we have m sub s. So what are our rules? Well, n can be one, two, three, all the way up to infinity. It's just any positive integer. L is gonna be zero, one, two, anything up until n minus one. M sub L can be anything from negative L to positive L, and M sub S can be positive one half or negative one half. These are the rules for the what is possible for a quantum number set. So just as an example, if n, I give it to you, is equal to 4, that means L has to be equal to, it can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. M sub L can be negative 4, negative 3, sorry. <laughs> it can be negative L to L. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And M sub S can be positive one half or negative one half. And there are ways to get more detailed with this. For example, if I said it was a 4s orbital, you know now that L is equal to zero because L is equal to zero for an s orbital, which we talked about in those little details of quantum number sets. So that means n is equal to four, L is equal to zero, so now m sub l can only be equal to zero. And of course, m sub s can be positive one half or negative one half. So these are just some details to get into, but what I can promise you about the quiz is it's all gonna revolve around what is possible. So you wanna make sure you just understand these rules over here. That's a one, just in case you missed that. <laughs> so unit three, was bonding and so you see some really important rules here some things that we want to know some fundamentals so this is going to be unit three predict the formula of an ionic bond now this is something that is really really important for alex and it's really not something that's taught a lot in 301 it's kind of expected that you know it so we need to overview some rules here so let's just say um Let's say we have barium and fluorine, and we make an ionic compound. The question would be, what is the formula for this ionic compound? And what is an ionic compound? It is a cation, a positively charged ion, with a, an anion, which is a negatively charged. So it's gonna be a metal with a positive charge and a non-metal with a negative charge. And we have our metal. This is our metal. Fluorine is our non-metal. So how do we know what the charge is actually going to be? Well, you're going to use the columns on the periodic table. So group one is going to have a positive one charge, most likely. Group two is going to have a positive two charge. Now, if we jump all the way to the other side, what do non-metals want to do? They actually want to gain electrons. So if you're in group seven, 
you're actually going to gain an electron to get to the noble gas configuration. So group 7 is going to have a negative 1 charge, and group 6 is going to have a negative 2 charge. So what group do you find barium in, Ba? That's going to be in group 2. So that's going to be a positive 2 charge. And then fluorine is going to be in group 7, so that's going to be a negative 1 charge. So when you put that together, in order to equal out this charge, you need to have two of these. And so you end up with barium fluoride, and it would look like that. There is a whole video on this. This was a sort of supplemental video, but I definitely want to make sure y'all know this for the quiz. So if what I just talked about didn't make a whole lot of sense, make sure that you go back to that video um, and that bonus module from unit three. Number seven was predict the type of bonds present in a compound based on its formula. And I just wanna give you the basic rules for this. Like I talked about above with the ionic bond, if you have a metal plus non-metal, that's gonna give you an ionic bond or compound. If you have a non-metal plus a non-metal, this is most likely going to be covalent. And remember that the mechanism behind this, an ionic bond, this is gonna occur because the metal is gonna lose the electron, the non-metal is gonna gain it. And in that process, it is a transfer of electrons. For the covalent bond, the non-metal and the non-metal have similar electron affinities. They kind of want the electrons about the same. And so instead of transferring electrons, they're actually just going to share electrons. It's pretty nice. Um, I do want to mention one kind of funky example because there's exceptions of both of these. There are examples of ionic bonds that exist exclusively with non-metals. There are examples of covalent bonds that have metals. We're not going to focus on that for this quiz, but I do want to point out one funky one. And that's something like anything containing hydrogen. So let's do hydrogen fluoride here. This is a non-metal. And remember that hydrogen, even though it exists in that top left, so it looks like it's in that metal zone, this is also a non-metal. So when you put these together, this is definitely going to be a covalent bond. So don't get freaked out by the existence of hydrogen. It is still a non-metal, even though it looks like it's on the metallic area of the periodic table. Just a heads up, because I am looking at the quiz right now, and I know it's on it. Number eight is draw simple Lewis structures using S is equal to N minus A. This one is something that you just want to rehearse the steps. You want to work hard on understanding that it's the shared electrons is equal to the needed minus the available. And if you want to make some sense out of this, just remember that when you solve for S, S divided by two is equal to the number of bonds. And so at this stage of the game, you can kind of use that to guess and check. But don't forget that if you draw something like, let's just say water, when you do all the steps, you're gonna get that S is equal to four, so the number of bonds is equal to two, and then you add your lone pairs in. And so you see here that you can, all, you can not only identify that there are two bonds, but another thing that's really important here is to identify that there are also two lone pairs. And that's a very common question that we ask at UT, is not just how many bonds are there, but finish the structure. Realize that the structure is not complete until you've added those lone pairs. And so make sure that you know that step as well. So the last thing that we're going to quiz you on, because we are not going to quiz you on thermodynamics, is right here, 9 and 10, unit 4, or gas laws. So here, I really want you to understand 
the what we call the eponymous gas laws these are, these are the gas laws that are named after people so you have Boyle's law which is that pressure and volume are inversely proportional so the way I like to write this is P1 V1 equals P2 V2 um, and this is the one out of these three that is inverse and then you have Charles Law and Avogadro's Law. So Charles Law is gonna look something like V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And this is gonna be direct. This is just saying that as temperature goes up, volume goes up. And then for Avogadro's Law, it's gonna look very similar. V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. Once again, this is direct. And this is stating that as volume, as number of moles goes up, volume goes up. So very simple relationships here. I want you to understand them in words as well as with calculations. And we want you to put it all together with this ideal gas law. So you can make calculations with this, but also I want you to see a couple things. Number one, this is just restating all those laws I have written above here. It's just all together now. But you can see that we know that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So anything on the same side here, so that would include number of moles and temperature actually, these are gonna be inverse relationships. Anything on the opposite side, so volume and number of moles, volume and temperature, and even pressure in these, which are laws that we don't, we didn't even talk about, these are all gonna be direct. So there are a lot more laws here than the ones we have written above, and that's the power of this particular equation. The last thing worth mentioning about it is the R value. So the R value is what ties all these units together. And remember, it should always match your pressure units. That's the secret to getting any PV equals NRT problem correct. All right, so now this is just a general overview of all of these. I will post this so that you can reflect on it, but if you want to just absolutely ace this quiz that's coming up, my recommendation, once again, is to redo each and every one of the problems on the lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, and lesson four quiz, and ask questions throughout the process, and hopefully you'll get down to that quiz and absolutely ace it. So good luck, and let me know if you have any questions.